All right, the sky and the earth, which doesn't include everything. This is what the ancients knew with some modern things thrown in about what we now know. Sky maps. Everybody has a sky map, whether you have the Messier Guide or one of our free sky maps or the just being handed out planispheres. You have a sky map that shows to a rather low degree of resolution the objects in the sky that we refer to as the constellations and stars. First, you've got to get one that suits your latitude. And these are set for around 40 degrees north latitude. The ones in the Messier guidebook and the freebies that we have are for 35, which is the latitude of Memphis. We'll see later on this evening during the presentation how moving around on the earth to different latitudes affects what you see from the sky in a very dramatic way. Then you use the date time guide, which either comes with, like it does in the Messier guidebook, or is printed around the edge of the planisphere. Notice where it has the date and the time. If you look at today's date and turn the wheel until the present time, around 8.30 p.m. shows up, then what you see on that sky map is what you would actually see outdoors were it not uh, overcast and so bright with stadium lights out there. Here's the one that's from the Messier Guide. If you read across and down, or down and across, if you prefer. You can see that if we start with, say, April 12th, which is close enough, and move across to around 8 p.m., you see that we're just getting into the April sky map, which isn't too surprising. That's why we call it the April sky map. But if you look out later on tonight, you'll see that we go successively through May, June, July, and just before sunrise tomorrow morning, we'll be into the August and almost September sky maps. Or another way of looking at it is what do you see at 9 p.m. on any given evening throughout the year? Well, in January, we see January, February, you see February, and you work your way on down, and you can see that going down a particular column for the same time of night, at different dates of the year also affects what you use. Now this may seem obvious to all of you. It was not to me when I first got started in astronomy. Uh, I was 12 years old in my defense and I was interested in maps and I decided to make a sky map. So I got paper, pencils, I even made a spherical thing by tracing segments across a, a globe that we had and made this thing that looked like a paper hat and I was going to make a star map inside of that. And I went out one night and started plotting stars and I went out a few nights later, much later in the evening after coming home from a movie and everything looked different. So I started erasing everything and moving it around and it didn't take uh, it took an embarrassingly long time for me to figure out that things moved around in the sky at night. You know, at that age, I certainly knew that the sun rose in the east and set in the west during the daytime because of the rotation of the earth, but it didn't occur to me that the stars kept doing the same thing at night because the earth didn't just stop rotating or reset to the next morning. It just kept right on turning. And so... Uh, I've learned a few things in the intervening years, but I didn't start out knowing even that. So if you think you're a beginner, I'll see if you can top that with uh, <laughs> getting off on the wrong foot. Okay, if you hold the map with the direction you're facing corresponding to whatever edge of the map is down. So most of you all are facing north, so if you hold the map with the north side down, and we're outside, you would see this part of the sky. If you turn around and face towards the east, hold the map with the east side down, and that corresponds to what you see in that part of the sky. And the directions of the compass are marked on the planisphere around the horizon, which is the edge of the map, and that uh, serves as the uh, which way you're facing in the particular direction in the sky. 
Okay, here's the April sky map, and we're looking towards the east. We can see over in the eastern sky, the brightest thing is the bright orange star Arcturus. If we look around uh, high in the northeastern sky, we see the Big Dipper. Over in the west, we can see the tail end of the winter constellations, Sirius and Canis Major, the Sirius the brightest star in the sky, Orion the hunter, and right next to Taurus is where the planet Venus is, so that's the most brilliant thing, which I think people in California have decided that there's a persistent UFO that they could see every night for the last month or so, and they're getting really concerned about it. Uh, beats me how grown people can have all of a sudden discover Venus, but uh, I think that's what they're doing. Nothing else seems to make any sense. They say it just hangs there night after night. <laughs> Sounds like Venus to me. The constellations themselves have no scientific basis. Uh, it was sort of like the precursor to TV programs and situations and dramas and things. People would see these patterns in the sky and imagine that they represented certain figures like their gods and made up stories about them which are quite intriguing and we won't have time to go into that tonight. But the mythology is interesting, and we cover some of that at our Village Creek uh, outings, such as tomorrow night, mainly in the autumn when we have several constellations involved in a big brouhaha of all of the interactions of six different constellations. The, all of these patterns, and this kicks back to what we had last month, or February actually, the constellations are made up of nearby stars in our galaxy. Remember that our Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. That is, it takes a beam of light 100,000 years going at 186,000 miles per second to go from one side of our galaxy to the other. When we go out into the night sky, all of the stars that we see are very close. We don't see over to the far side of our galaxy by any means. They're all within a few hundred to maybe a thousand light years compared to 100,000. So we're looking at maybe 1% of our galaxy on a good clear night outdoors. So this, we're just looking at our nearest next door neighbors and those are the things that make up the familiar constellations. Now as we also saw then, we can see the band of light all the way around the sky that corresponds to the plane of our galaxy. The 100 billion stars that make it up, even though we can't see them as individual dots, their combined glow contributes to this Via Lactea, or milky path, across the sky that the ancients recognized, and which we have to drive an hour out into the country in order to be able to see. You'd be amazed how many people have never seen the Milky Way until we go out on an observing session, get out of the car, and they look around and they're just overwhelmed because uh, they've never seen it before. 88 constellations altogether. Same as the number of keys on a standard piano. Uh, you don't have to learn them all. There's some that you won't ever see from this latitude and others that aren't worth seeing. That are made up of maybe two or three dim stars just to sort of fill in that area. Sort of like the viola section of the sky. So, <laughs> uh -oh. how, many, how could there be that many violas? <laughs> They're important but they don't stand out, or they're not supposed to. <laughs> okay, here's what you do need to do, though, is to learn the major constellations for each of the seasons of the year. Like you, you got to know Orion and Canis Major and Scorpius, Sagittarius. Those are ones you absolutely have to know. And they will help you find other constellations, and we've seen some of that before. We'll take a uh, look at a couple of those uh, this evening. You should learn the names of all the first magnitude stars. There are only about 20 of them, and several of them you can't see from here anyway, so that makes it a manageable task to learn the names of the first magnitude stars, and a few other important ones like Polaris, the North Star, and Castor, and Gemini, and so on. Okay, here's what I didn't know in 1957. 
The Earth rotates eastward on its axis, making one rotation per day. Well, I guess I did know that. And I did know this, that that's what causes the sun to appear to rise and set each day. Diurnal, daily, same thing. Also, the stars do the same thing at night because of the Earth's rotation. And that was new information for me when I was just getting started. The Earth's axis of rotation points towards the North Star, Polaris. So Polaris stays in the same place in the sky all the time. If you start playing with your planisphere there and rotating the disk around, you'll see that Polaris remains in the same spot on the map in the northern part of the sky while other stars rise and set and the ones close to Polaris just circle around it. That's because it's directly above the north pole of the Earth. The ones close to Polaris never set. If you turn your planisphere around, you'll see that the stars in the Little Dipper, Polaris is at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper, and the bowl and handle swing around as you rotate the sky around. And you'll see that all of the stars in the Little Dipper are always above the horizon here. They're so close to Polaris that as they make that circle, they don't ever dip below the horizon. But if you look along the celestial equator, you'll see that stars rise and set when they're far enough away from Polaris. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. And the farther a star is from Polaris, the more time it spends below the horizon. Starting with zero time for Polaris itself and anything in the Little Dipper and the other circumpolar constellations like Cepheus, Cassiopeia, Draco, the, and part of the, uh, well, the Big Dipper part of Ursa Major, those are always up here. And you get farther away from that, there are more time below the horizon and less time up. Here's something you can do. If you find a dark enough place, you can do this with a cell phone these days. Uh, this one, somebody opened it up. It looks like about six hours, doesn't it? Because you can see an arc that's about a fourth of the way around, and that's a fourth of a day. So that's, uh, they had to have the lens open for about six hours. Uh, here is Polaris itself, and these are the stars of the Little Dipper. Here are some of the ones of the Big Dipper. And we get farther and farther away, you can see that the complete circles around the North Star as the Earth rotates. And the ones that are far enough away, those have been below the horizon and come up. These over here are going to actually go down below the horizon because they're too far to make the complete circle without going below the horizon. So these are called circumpolar stars and constellations. In a way, that's a strange term because they're all circumpolar, aren't they? They all go around the North Star, but what they mean by circumpolar is ones that don't ever uh, rise or set. They're always up. The zenith. Here's some points. Of, should be pronounced zenith, and the, this is an Arabic term, like many in astronomy. Those are, uh, that's the overhead point. Ever since the television company back in the 50s and 60s started making televisions and calling them zeniths, I think it's been a lost cause to ever reclaim that word to the correct pronunciation. So uh, zenith is the way most people pronounce it, even though it should be zenith. The meridian is the imaginary line that starts at the northern horizon, goes straight overhead through the zenith down to the southern horizon. And it stays put as the Earth turns. It's part of your location is the meridian. And the stars cross it during the night as the Earth rotates. So it's the north-south line passing through the overhead point. The celestial equator. This is an imaginary line around the sky directly above the Earth's equator. If you were, uh, had a model of the Earth, and you saw the equator on it, and you extended the plane of the Earth's equator all the way out to where it intersected the dome of the sky, and then drew a little dotted line along it, that would be the celestial equator. And that is on your map, is marked as the celestial equator. It goes from the eastern horizon, not directly overhead here, and then sets in the western horizon due west. So that's the celestial equator. It divides the uh, sky into the northern and southern 
hemispheres just like the Earth's equator does on the Earth. So anything between Polaris and the celestial equator is in the northern celestial hemisphere, and then south of that is the southern celestial hemisphere. And as I mentioned, it does go from the eastern horizon to the western. If you were at the Earth's equator, the equator, the celestial equator, does pass, pass through the zenith. It starts straight east, goes straight up overhead, and then straight down to the western horizon. But we're not at the Earth's equator. Anywhere in the northern terrestrial hemisphere, which is where we are, the celestial equator doesn't go overhead, but goes south of overhead by a distance equal to your latitude. So it hits the eastern horizon, but instead of going straight up like it does at the equator, it slants up and doesn't pass straight overhead and then back down to the western horizon again. How far south of overhead is it here? Well, the latitude of Memphis is 35 degrees, so the celestial equator passes 35 degrees south of directly overhead. But it does start at the eastern horizon, go straight to the western horizon. And that's on your handout star maps and uh, to the extent you can tell uh, on the planisphere as well. So 35 degrees here. At the North Pole, the celestial equator goes all the way around the horizon. The pole star Polaris is straight overhead. 90 degrees from that would be the horizon. So the celestial equator is the same as the horizon all the way around. And as the time progresses at the North Pole, Polaris stays straight overhead. All the other stars move around parallel to the horizon, and the ones that are right on the horizon would be like Orion's belt. You'd see Orion's upper half sticking up out of the ground. His lower half would always be below the ground at the North Pole. So it makes a big difference as to where you are on the Earth. Now, how long are things up and down? Well, we've seen that stars near Polaris are up all the time. And a star on the celestial equator is up for 12 hours, down for 12 hours. So the stars in Orion's belt, if they happen to rise at 7 p.m., will set at 7 a.m. So they're up exactly 12 hours from being on the celestial equator. A star, uh, because we're into the, here's just a uh, redefinition of the celestial equator. For stars north of the celestial equator, they're above the horizon more than they're down. So uh, the ultimate example being the circumpolar constellations like the Little Dipper, it's up all the time. The stars in the northern part of Orion, his shoulder and head, are up more than 12 hours because they're getting closer to Polaris. The ones that are farther away, like Rigel and his heel, are not quite up 12 hours. The 12 hours applies only to the celestial equator where his belt is. So south of the celestial equator, below the horizon, more than there above. Here's another thing that you can do, and this is to take a picture aimed near the celestial equator. You can see that here's the uh, straightest lines. Those are the stars along the celestial equator. Here one's towards the north. Polaris is up over here somewhere, and you can see the circles that they're trying to make. We're only seeing little short portions of those arcs. Farther south, we see things that are uh, only up a short amount of time, and their uh, arcs are curved the other direction. We can tell where are we located on the Earth here. Well, we're not at the equator, are we? You, you can tell that because these aren't straight up. If we were at the equator, all of these lines would be straight up. And you can tell that we're in the northern hemisphere, can't you? Because if these are you have to believe me that these are rising. So if this is rising, we're facing east, so north is up this way, so Polaris is up above the horizon, so we're somewhere in the northern hemisphere. So it's kind of like here, equatorial star trails. Now we're gonna see all of those things from the perspective of the planetarium software, if it works. Keep your fingers crossed say a little prayer, but uh, 
Let's see what happens here. Okay. All right. I've got it set to move 300 times as fast, so it goes by pretty quickly. Now let's just see. We're, this is the present time, nearly 8 o'clock on April 10th. We're looking towards the east, as you can see from the letter E right there. Here's the celestial equator in red going right down to the eastern horizon. Here's Arcturus, Boates over in the east. Here's the Big Dipper. Follow the arc of the handle to Arcturus. Uh, so these are the things that we would see in the eastern part of the sky. And you can set your planisphere for this with Arcturus just over the eastern horizon. Now if we set it in motion, we can see that things are moving up, but not straight up. Anything along the eastern horizon is moving up at an angle that's not straight up, but tilted 35 degrees from going straight up. And we can see as the evening progresses, see it's now 9.30 going on 10 o'clock. We see other constellations coming up in the northeast that we couldn't see before. Others over in the southeast, Corvus, Hydra, uh, interesting constellations that we wouldn't see till later on tonight or later on in the year. Uh, let's look around towards the south. Grab this and move it around towards facing south. Now we can see things moving across the southern part of the sky. Here's the long constellation Hydra that goes all the way across the entire spring sky. Now at, after midnight, here's Scorpius coming up, Antares, the bright red supergiant star that we talked about last time that's as big as the orbit of Mars practically. Um, here is uh, Centaurus that contains the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, but we can't see it from here. It's below the horizon. Can you see the sort of arc that things are making there in the south part of the sky? You can see that the south celestial pole is below the horizon here by 35 degrees. So everything within 35 degrees of the south pole never rises here. It's like anti-circumpolar. The ones that are within 35 degrees of Polaris are always up. The ones within 35 degrees of the south pole are never up here. Let's look over in the west and see what's happening. Again, the celestial equator in red goes right down onto the western horizon. We can see the uh, constellations that we were seeing in the east, like Arcturus and Boates. They're now moving down over towards the northwest. Here's the Big Dipper. Handle still points to Arcturus. That doesn't change, but their position in the sky does as we rotate. Now, if we look back to the north again, we'll see the whole idea of the circumpolar constellations again. Here's the north celestial pole at Polaris, 35 degrees above the northern horizon here. Here's the Big Dipper. Um, then we can see the Little Dipper coming out from Polaris. There's the bowl of the Little Dipper. Um, we can see uh, Cepheus, Cassiopeia, Draco, other constellations. Um, we need to step back just a little bit and whoops there we go there's Cassiopeia and uh, Perseus and Cepheus these are the ones that are circumpolar here the, these five the Big Dipper, Little Dipper, Cassiopeia, Cepheus and the long winding constellation of Draco okay Let's go ahead and stop that and we minimize back to here. Okay, the effect of latitude, that's what's coming up right now. Let's see what I need. I don't need this, I do need this. Okay, we've already pretty much seen this, but this just kind of nails it down. The observer's latitude affects the altitude of Polaris above the northern horizon. So at the equator, well, let's do the North Pole first. 
your latitude at the North Pole is 90 degrees, right? And it's straight up overhead, 90 degrees above the horizon. At the equator, what's the latitude there? Well, that's zero. And where is it? It's just right on the northern horizon. Zero degrees above the horizon. So, so far, we are detecting a pattern. 90 degrees latitude, 90 degrees above the horizon. Zero degrees latitude, zero degrees. And if you make the assumption that that's true in between, you will be correct. That if our latitude is 35 degrees here, then the altitude of Polaris is also 35 degrees above the northern horizon. You used, that used to be very useful for navigation purposes before there were GPSs. You could determine your latitude, like at sea, for example, by sighting on Polaris and seeing how far above the horizon it was. It wouldn't tell you where you were east to west, longitude-wise, but it'd rule out a whole lot of ocean if you knew right which latitude line you were on. Okay. So circumpolar constellations are those within 35 degrees, and here they are again, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, at least the Big Dipper portion, Cassiopeia, Cepheus, and Draco. So those are the circumpolar constellations here. At the North Pole, all the constellations you can see are circumpolar, aren't they? Because the North Star is straight overhead. Everything that's up is always up. Anything that's ever above the horizon is staying above the horizon. It just moves around in circles parallel to the ground. So the whole northern half of the sky is circumpolar at the North Pole. The whole other half you never see. So you better like the northern hemisphere sky if you live at the North Pole because you'll never see anything else but. And I could say that you would just see it in different directions, but if you're at the North Pole, there really is only one direction, and that's south whichever way you look. So other than what icebergs are sticking up, that's the only variety you would have. <laughs> so Polaris stationary overhead. It's kind of like being on a merry-go-round. I noticed this when I was a little kid. They had a merry-go-round at the fairgrounds, and the top of it was open. And if you looked up, which wasn't recommended for little kids, you'd see everything moving around and the trees right overhead looked like they were standing still, and all the ones around the edge were whipping around. That's pretty much the way the sky looks from the North Pole, is Polaris stationary overhead, everything else just circling around above the horizon. At the equator, the situation is just diametrically opposed, or 90 degrees opposed, I guess. The, <laughs> the, Circumpolar constellations would include all of those within zero degrees of Polaris, which isn't anything, really. In fact, for half of the year, since Polaris isn't exactly at the North Pole, you'd have to stand on tiptoe to even see it over the northern horizon. So there are no circumpolar constellations. You get a, the total variety of sky. During the year, you eventually get to see everything. But uh, it, nothing is up all the time at the equator. Polaris is stationary on the northern horizon. All stars rise in the east, move across the sky, going straight up, up for 12 hours, and then uh, set in the west 12 hours later, stay down for 12 hours. So everything's very orderly at the equator. And all the stars are eventually visible at the equator. So, and we already mentioned this, but here it is again. All the stars within 35 degrees of the south celestial pole are never seen from here. So stars, some of the more famous ones, like the Southern Cross, Alpha and Beta Centauri, those are not ever seen from here. Okay, so now let's take a look at what happens when we move around on the surface of the Earth. Okay, so let's get it moving again. Now... We're going to Fairbanks, Alaska, which is at 65 degrees north latitude. So, options, view and location. And here's where it's a little troublesome because there are about 10,000 cities on here. And the resolution of this is kind of jerky. So, okay, Fairbanks, Alaska. All right, and view from there. That goes through a little routine where we actually fly up to there. Now, 
That's kind of neat about the first ten times. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. But uh, this is not an outhouse. This is an observatory <laughs> at Fairbanks. Notice how much higher up Polaris is there than here. In fact, you see the Big Dipper has cleared the horizon by a comfortable amount instead of just scraping across it. And here goes uh, Vega and Lyra and Cygnus is circumpolar. And uh, most of Boötes is, except for Arcturus. So we can see that farther north with the uh, Polaris 65 degrees above the northern horizon, uh, a lot more of the northern sky is visible. In fact, if we pull this down a little bit, you can see that the zenith is uh, pretty close by to where the north celestial pole is. So it's, what, 65 degrees down to here, and what's 65 from 90? You know, 20, 25. So it's only 25 from there to straight up. Okay, let's look around towards the east from there. And we see some differences already. Here's the celestial, celestial equator. So it's tilted 65 degrees from being straight up. Way different from here, the 35 degrees. We can see that things are moving up at a very shallow angle as they rise in the east. Still rise in the east, set in the west, but the perspective is a lot different when we're that far north. And when we go around to the facing the south, look how low the celestial equator is in the sky. It's not all that far above the southern horizon. So uh, things are quite different up there. Um, let's go ahead all the way up to the North Pole. How steady my hand is here. North Pole. All right. Yep. Or a forlorn polar bear as the ice, last iceberg melts away. Okay. Now, here's, uh, here's what's happening. Notice, first of all, which way we're facing. It's south in every direction. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference. Uh, here's some stars near the celestial equator which are just moving around the horizon. Let's speed it up here a little bit to Here's the sun, by the way. Let's stop this for a moment. Remember we had the vernal equinox not too long ago and the sun is now in the northern part of the sky. You can actually see it moving a little farther north. That means you can see it from the North Pole. Uh, First day of spring is a momentous occasion there, even more than here, because the sun has been invisible for six months, and now it's finally up. So here it is in Pisces, moving around uh, parallel with the horizon. It doesn't rise or set because of the rotation of the earth. The only rising and setting the sun does is due to its motion around the sky as the earth revolves around the sun. So... Uh, and let's see, if we move here, the north, I don't, that word north is messed up looking because zenith is right underneath it. The north celestial pole and the zenith are the same place when we're at the north pole of the earth. And the celestial equator goes all the way around the horizon, and the whole south half of the sky is invisible. Now let's do a, a different situation. We go down to Quito, Ecuador. Uh, amazing number of cities that start with QU. And we're still not down there. There we go. Quito, Ecuador. And once again, we'll skip the trip and just wind up there. Okay, let's uh, look towards the north to start with. Okay, Polaris, well you can see the Little Dipper there. Polaris is just right on the northern horizon. And 
Nothing is circumpolar. Things are coming up in the east, circling around Polaris, but all of them are up half the time, down half the time. So that's the way things look from there. As the name of the country implies, it's on the equator, and we're right here 13 minutes. At Quito, Ecuador, we're 13 minutes, which is just a matter of a couple of miles, I think, south of the equator. So we are virtually on the Earth's equator. If we look around towards the east, now look, celestial equator going straight up and everything along it moving straight up uh, perpendicular to the eastern horizon. So, Ecuador. One more. This time. Viewing location. Melbourne. It's a silent R, in case you've ever been there, you'll find that out right away. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. We went there to see the southern sky. Uh, the idea was to go someplace that was where they spoke at least a form of English and were more or less friendly to Americans, and that kind of ruled out a lot of places, so we... Uh, wound up in Australia. Now here we're looking south and the south celestial pole is about 35 degrees above the horizon there. They're just about as far south as we are north. And there are no bright stars near there or anywhere near the south celestial pole. So you're kind of on your own to set up your telescope there. There are little ways of doing it but it's not like you can just plop it down and aim it at Polaris. And it looks like it's going the opposite direction, but it really isn't. We're just seeing the opposite end of the same celestial sphere. Here's the Southern Cross, and um, Alpha and Beta Centauri, uh, uh, Delta, Gamma, there they go. Yeah, that's Alpha and Beta Centauri and the Southern Cross. Circling around the almost invisible south celestial pole. And we go over to the east. And here's something, we were there for more than two weeks and I never got used to this, watching things rise and slant up towards the upper left instead of going over this way like they're supposed to. <laughs> Especially the sun. The sun would come up and then slide up to the north like it is right there. So you can see that, that's disconcerting. And the moon was always at some catapultous weird angle, and uh, it, it never did look right the whole time we were there. And uh, let's see, here's, a, uh, here's Orion, upside down. <laughs> Rigel's up there, Betelgeuse, his shoulders down there. And uh, let me move it to where the zenith is there. It's amazing what goes by directly overhead. Scorpius was overhead. We were there in the middle of our summer, which was their winter. We'll get to that shortly. But uh, here's Centaurus. There's uh, Alpha and Beta again. When you go out at night, there's a tremendous number of first magnitude stars that we don't see from here. It's a glittering thing. Here's Scorpius coming up at a very strange angle, isn't it? There's Antares, and there's the head of the scorpion. And you can see that from Melbourne, it goes by just about straight overhead. And if you want to see all of those nice objects in the Milky Way, the deep sky objects that are there, that's uh, highly recommended that you take that trip sometime. Okay, so the last part of this half is about the revolution of the Earth. Okay, we all know this. The Earth goes around the sun once a year, moving in an eastwardly direction, the same way it rotates at night. And this is the annual motion, causes the constellations seen at a given time on the same night to advance during the year. And we've already seen that with the sky maps. The diurnal and annual motions have the same effect in the sky. During the night, constellations over in the east move up higher because the Earth's rotating. Later on in the year, at the same time of night, those constellations are up higher 
because of the Earth moving around the sun towards the east. So since they're uh, both eastward motions, they both have the same effect. One of them is just faster than the other. And if you look at either the planisphere or the schedule of uh, sky maps in the Messier guidebook, you'll see that just before sunrise, you get to see a preview of the constellations of the opposite season of the year. So if you don't want to wait till August to see what the sky looks like, just stay up late tonight or get up early tomorrow morning and look out early, and that's be what the evening sky looks like several months from now. So here's that uh, again. If we're here now, just before sunrise, we'll see August or even September, which is almost on the opposite half of the year. In the darkest part of winter, you can see farther than the other side, but you know, in the summer, uh, you don't have as long a night, so we don't have as much, we don't get to see the whole opposite side of the sky, but it's, you can sure see way far ahead. Here's, uh, just look at this, memorize this. <laughs> Here's the March sky map, compare that to April ones if you have it. See Spica right on the horizon and Arcturus. Now we'll jump to the May one ahead of uh, where we are now. See there's Arcturus and Spica moved up there. Or the same thing several hours later on the same night. Okay, so same effect on what's seen in the sky. A little bit of uh, terminology here. 12 months of revolution, one year, is the same as one day, 24 hours in a day. If we divide this by 12, one month of revolution is worth two hours of rotation. So if you want to see what the sky looks like a month from now, just look at it two hours later, and that will give you the same result. Divide that in half, two weeks is about an hour. Take it down, divide by 14, and we see that uh, one day of revolution is four minutes of rotation. This means that the same stars rise four minutes earlier each night. So if you were to go out and see exactly when Antares would rise tonight, and you time it again tomorrow night, it would be four minutes earlier because of the difference in the uh, period of rotation and revolution as the Earth goes around the sun, we gain four minutes a day. And when we get back from the intermission, we'll see about solar sidereal time, precession, and the age of Aquarius, and all kinds of good stuff. So don't go away. So, okay. Thank you.